Let us continue with our reflection. Above all, pay close attention. So we learn to differentiate what it is to truly live in the divine will according to what our Lord taught Louisa and what it is to do the will of God to the extent that this way of life has been known up to our present time. And as Christians, what should be our proper attitude? Because without God's will, without doing the will of God, salvation would not even be available for us. In order to be saved, we need to do the will of God, at least at the very minimum, like repentance at the point of death. And in doing the will of God, there are different degrees, different levels, of which the last or least level, as I previously said, is to accept death as part of God's will, repenting of all your sins and receiving salvation. This would be the minimal degree of someone who did not do the will of God during his whole life, lived in mortal sin and repents at the final moment, at this point accepts the will of God in his life and is saved. In relation to God's will, creatures have different attitudes before their Creator. In relation to his will, there are different ways of relating or living with God's will. One attitude could be of one who at some point of his life resigns himself to the will of God. This seems like an attitude of someone who in some way sadly resigns himself to endure to endear a will of God that is superior to him and that at some point seems to be contrary to one's own will. But since it is a superior will, it seems that he does not have any other option but to resign and endure. As we can all understand, this attitude is sad because here is the loving Father with a divine will that disposes with infinite wisdom for the good of his creatures. And we, poor blind creatures, unable to discover this, feel as if the will of God crushes us and saddened. We resign ourselves. Well, it is an attitude in which how much good can the soul receive having this attitude of simply resigning? Well, very little good, and you frequently hear about it. How many times have we not heard, especially when it comes, to the death of a child, the death of a father or a mother, resign yourself. You have no other choice. Resign yourself. How much good does the soul receive in this attitude? Well, very little. It is almost a defensive attitude against an infinitely loving, infinitely wise God who disposes events disposes events in our life and we react by defending ourselves. There is a higher degree of doing the will of God. That would be to conform ourselves to the will of God. Whatever God wants, I want it too. 
even though sometimes it may hurt me. ¿Y por qué nos duele hacer la voluntad de Dios? And why does it hurt us to do God's will? Is it that we have not recognized and understood, as I was telling you, that the will of God is the will of a loving God that by doing His will is giving us goods, not only temporarily, but eternally? Why does it hurt us? Why is it so hard for us to accept this? It is because we think about it differently. We think about it from the point of view of our will and of me or I. And then when some disposition, some circumstance ordained or allowed by that divine will seems to crush me, then it hurts. And here comes that second way of doing the will of God, conforming or to conform myself with the will of God. Here, I forget myself more, and I not only resign myself, but I try to desire what God wants from me. Here, evidently, the soul who does everything in this attitude of conforming to God's will receives more grace and light in all she does, and she is formed according to how God's wills in the different life circumstances. There is an attitude superior to these two. It is abandonment in the will of God. This is an abandonment of the soul to the will of God, which says, May God do in me as He wants. I am willing to find the will of God in everything to be abandoned. In the will of God, like a child that abandons himself in the arms of his mother, Obviously, this attitude allows the soul to receive more grace from God and conform, and conform more to God's ways, because in this attitude, one begins to leave one's own ways. There is still a higher degree than that of abandoning oneself that is not merely holy abandonment in the will of God. Rather, it is union with the will of God so that it is no longer that God does what He wants of me or be abandoned in the hands of God, but I am going to take an active attitude, not that of a passive abandonment, but I am going to do together with God what He wants to do with me, whether it is hard for me or not to do it. This is already an active attitude. And this active attitude, there are also different degrees of being able to receive more or less grace. In this active attitude of the creature that wants to do together with God what God does to have a really effective activity, the soul needs to know what the will of God does. What the will of God does in order to want it and have the intention to do it together with the will of God. As you can see, this is the attitude of active union, not a union of abandonment, much less resignation, but an active attitude guided by knowledge, and our knowledge allows this activity to become more extensive 
We want that our activity be in union with the will of God. That our attitude and our activity take place in the will of God should ever more extend in that great ocean that is the will of God with us wanting to do what God does which in reality is what we ask for in the Our Father. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because we do not only ask your will be done that is to say that we also resign nor do we ask your will be done that we all conform or that we all abandon ourselves we do ask your will be done on earth as it is in heaven this is what we ourselves ask this is the culminating point of the spiritual journey of the most intimate relationship that can exist between creator and creature and between creature and creator which is why it was exactly what Jesus first asked for and then left us asking for it the will of God done on earth as in heaven I repeat no longer the will of God done with resignation the will of God done with heroism the will of God done with abandonment no the will of God done on earth as in heaven first he left us asking for it for so many years but pay attention he did not teach us how the will of God is done in heaven we know how the creatures on earth do it in the different degrees that we have examined but how the will of God is done in heaven we don't know if any of the apostles when Jesus taught them to pray had paid attention it's a way of speaking they would have said to Jesus Lord I didn't understand you how is it done how is the will of God done in heaven so I know what I'm asking for because I understand God's will to be done on earth more or less from my point of view but what do you say about how it is done in heaven give us an explanation expand on that point because either you tell us how things are done in heaven or no one will be able to tell us not even the theologian of theologians because here we are not talking about theology but of revelation how are we going to know or make up how the will of God is done in heaven it is absolutely impossible so enlighten us more on this point but as I told you no one asked but they learned to ask for God's will to be done and that is as far as they reached be it be done on earth as it is in heaven Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit had to illuminate the creature through all these centuries and it is precisely what our Lord teaches Louisa in some chapter he tells her my daughter the whole church has asked me for 2,000 years that my will be done on earth as it is in heaven and to fulfill that promise that I made when formulating the Our Father and 20 centuries of the church asking me your will be done on earth as it is in heaven now I want to fulfill what they ask and that I taught that I taught for which to fulfill it it is necessary that I teach you how the will of God is done in heaven 
so that the complete petition of the Our Father may be fulfilled. Because although Jesus carried it out and fulfilled it, he carried out redemption and he fulfilled the promise of redemption made to Adam. He likewise left us this promise. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First, the request formulated by him where he obtains it for himself. Well, he was the incarnate word. He already did the will of God on earth as is in heaven. He had his divine will as is done in heaven. But had he had it on the earth in his humanity. We could say that Jesus is the will of God on earth as in heaven, as the eternal God. In the incarnate word, in his humanity, that is the earth, as in heaven on earth. Many times in the Old Testament, Jesus is prophesied as the land. Remember that very famous promise of the promised land that all the Jews wanted to reach. The promised land flowing with milk and honey. I do not believe that in Palestine there are rivers of honey and fountains of milk. Because it wasn't this. In Jesus, there I believe there is milk and honey. Well then, earth understood as the human part. He said, to, he said the same to Adam. You are earth. You are dust. Well then, I repeat, and to return to the subject, it is to Louisa that our Lord comes to show how the will of God is done in heaven, so that at last the part of the Our Father of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven may be fulfilled, as it is in God the incarnate word. And this is where we also begin by reading Luisa's writings to discover this dimension of God's will and how it operates in his interior. Not only the part of the God's will be done, which makes reference to the fulfillment of the dispositions, of the commandments, of the evangelical councils, since all of them encompass the dispositions of the will of God, but rather to enter, discover, know how the will of God is done in the interior, how God does His will. Because up to now, we know how we do our will. And with this knowledge of our own will and how it works, we want to return to the order of the will of God by fulfilling His dispositions. But in order to know how the will of God operates, the only thing that man has is our being image and likeness of God. And we have tried to discover how God's will operates by using the human will as reference based on our human experience of how our will works. But we cannot advance very far in our understanding because we are starting from the human and how from our being image and likeness of God we might understand or illuminate how God does His will. And as I told you, 
we need God to reveal to us how His will, or how He does His will. Or we have no other way to be able to delve into this other than our own will. Either God tells us how He does His will, or we are only left with the effects of His will that we can find in creation. We are left guessing how the will of God operates. Last night, we more or less reviewed some qualities of the operating in the divine will. Jose Luis gives some instructions to someone. We already saw some of the qualities with which the divine will operates and which are very different from the qualities of how the human will works. We can also take this example to go a little deeper. We have pets, a dog, a cat, are moved by an instinct that God put in them. All the acts they do, eating, walking, are acts dogs do. And I don't say it in a derogatory way, or acts of a cat, or of a little bird. It can be any animal of your choice. If a dog walks, it is the walking of a dog, of an animal. Its act begins with the instinct to walk. If a man walks, his walking is like that of a dog. He moves from one place to another. As in eating, if a dog eats, it proceeds from its animal instinct, the instinct to eat. If a man eats, it is the same. Man chews food, swallows it, and digests it. But this act does not start from instinct, but from a human will. So the act of eating in the dog is an animal act, and the act of eating in man is a human act. Why? Because it proceeds, or that act takes life from a human will, and the act of eating in a man has all the qualities that the human will possesses, but which the will of a dog does not possess. And if Jesus eats, as he did, what act was it? True God and true man? Here we have it. So Jesus externally eating, he was doing the same as when we eat, chewing, passing food. But from what will did he proceed? What will was giving life to the act of Jesus eating? The divine will together with his human will in that hypostatic union between the second person of the Holy Trinity and the humanity of Jesus. Jesus ate, and it was not the same as me eating, because that act of Jesus received life. It received life from his essence of his divine will together with his human will. And I repeat, he externally chewed, had saliva, swallowed the food, digested food as we do too. But what a difference. Because in Jesus, all this was vivified. 
It was vivified by His divine will that in union with His human will, everything was vivified by His divine will. Because the divine will became the life of the human will of Jesus. Then, if we examine how the divine will worked in the humanity of Jesus, as we did yesterday a little, we are going to be able to discover that Jesus is not just another. He's not even a great saint. For those who do not know him, he is just another prophet, like the Jews say of him. One more prophet, and in addition, one who failed. They see things externally and in a human way. How can we say, as Jews currently say, that he was a prophet who failed? If we, if with the simple act of eating, he filled eternity. Because the act of eating in Jesus, vivified by his divine will, fills eternity. They say that he failed that he did not know how to do it. He did not know how to do it their way. But he knew how to do it God's way. And the same can be said about everything that Jesus did. That is why he externally did very few extraordinary things. Because the importance was not in what he did externally, but rather internally interiorly. The Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother Mary, and that is why she is our mother, because she also had the divine will that vivified all her acts. If I eat, or if you eat, it is the eating of a human being. If the Blessed Virgin ate, it was an act. Of what? Jose Luis Acuna asked the audience, and someone in the audience answers. It is a divine act done by the Blessed Mother. And if we also add to this the mission of the Blessed Mother, then we could say the act of eating in the Blessed Mother was an act of divine maternity. Not only an act done by the divine will in her, and she in the divine will, but of divine maternity. And so, externally, she was a person like any of us, or like you, who ate. But in her interior, it was an act of a divine maternity. And that's why we all quite naturally say, Our Mother Mary, because one of the qualities that the divine will has when it operates is universality. So, outwardly, the Blessed Mother ate bread, but what was happening internally? An explosion of divine maternity. But of course, what was seen on the outside? Nothing. That the Blessed Mother Mary, the carpenter's wife, was having breakfast. Well, these are the ways that living in the divine will wants to become life in us, to, to communicate to our acts all the qualities it possesses. And this can be done because the divine will already did it. This divine will has already fulfilled this plan of transforming human acts into divine acts. The divine will has done it in the humanity of Jesus and did it in the Blessed Virgin. As I was telling you, human acts changed into divine acts by virtue of the will that animated them. I don't know if this will deviate us a bit. Imagine that we were capable of 
communicating qualities of our human actions to our pet dog. That we could humanize a dog's instinct with our will at the moment the dog eats. And if this was possible, in a way, we could say that when the dog ate, it acted in my will. If it was possible, although we know it is not possible because there are two actions with different natures, but for God it is possible because although the divine nature and the human nature are different, but this was accomplished in the hypostatic union of the two natures in Jesus. For a God to give his will, well, it is not that he gave it, because it, he, God himself, who made it operate in his humanity. The divine nature operated together with the human nature. And it communicated to that human nature all the qualities of the divine nature. And since this has already been done in Jesus, let us say, humanly speaking, what God has already done, it is now available to whoever wants it. And this is so because Jesus himself prayed for it, as we reflected on last night. Father, may all be one as you and I are one. The main point of Jesus' prayer is not about the union among us, but the union in Jesus in the measure of the Father's perfect unity with his Son, Jesus being the incarnate Word. Consequently, when this union that we ask for takes place, making us united, but in the unity in each one of us, as the Father is one with Jesus, on the day when this happened in each one of us, then we will all be one among us. As long as this does not happen, we can never be one among us, because each one will live by himself, with his own or her own human will. When we all live as one, like the Father and Jesus do, we will all be one also among ourselves. So, in all of Luisa's writings, our Lord gradually leads Luisa to know how the will of God operates, how God does His will. If we go to eternity, how is the will of God done in the interior of God? What does the will of God do inside God? What we say on Sundays? The eternal generation of the Word originating by the action of the Holy Spirit. Well, not every Sunday, but when we pray the creed, I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, and Jesus Christ, begotten, not made, by the Holy Spirit. The will of God is what forms the heartbeat, the interior life of the Holy Trinity, and that, of course, being active, and being life, that proceeds from a will that wants something, and that volition is what forms the act. So, the will of God done in the interior of God generates the eternal word by the action of the Holy Spirit. In one word, the divine will is the vital heartbeat of the Holy Trinity. Then, that divine will decides to operate outwards, 
incarnating the word for which all of creation was formed. Remember, as St. Paul says, that we have all been created in Christ. Everything was created for Christ. <laughs> when nothing was yet created, in God was the thought of the Word incarnate. To have that thought, the divine will puts itself in an attitude. It puts itself in the act of creating all things so that the Word we could say would have a place to reside in to become incarnate. Of course, in that thought before everything was created, the Blessed Virgin <coughs> was already present. Because when thinking of the word incarnate, the Divine Maternity of Mary automatically had to be present in the mind of God. There cannot be any separation between the Word incarnate and the Divine Maternity of Mary. It is as if we thought of a son without a mother. The absence of a mother? Think of a son without the mother's existence or that the mother never existed. For this reason, when one speaks of Jesus taking this understanding into account, we are obviously also speaking of the Blessed Mother, of the Divine Maternity, of Mary. Because if we are talking about the Son, we are talking about the Divine Maternity automatically, even though this word may not be mentioned. Then that Divine Will decided, we could say, to put in act the word incarnate and begins by providing a dwelling for the incarnate word, forming first the entire machine of creation, a son, because the word needed to have a body when incarnated. <coughs> and since the word incarnate would have lungs, God begins by creating the air. So the lungs of the Word incarnate would breathe when that time came to be. And so, with all things in creation, which is the dwelling of the humanity of Jesus, so that the will of God may be done on earth, as it was done in heaven, because before creation the will of God was done in heaven, as in heaven. In the eternal generation of the Word by the Holy Spirit. Then God wants His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the Word incarnate. And continuing, God makes all material, all material creation with a single created act coming from His will. God makes all things come out of nothingness. Consider this. With a single act of divine will, God makes all things out of nothingness. What power this will has in it? Who can imagine the power of that divine will that with a simple being and act creates millions and millions of things out of nothing? What kind of will are we talking about? And then, not content with that, because the acts done in the will of God are continuous and never lose the effects they produce, 
The next thing that comes about is the conservation of all things so that they do not return to nothingness. If God had withdrawn his creative act, withdrawn it, things would have returned to their nothingness. But, O oh power of God's will, and we become created. All because a will of infinite power, of infinite wisdom, did that act, and the outcome is us being here now. If it were not for that created act, the will of God, of creation, we would not be here, nor anywhere else. But if we are here, it is because we absolutely depend on that creative act of the divine will that wanted to create us and made that act of creating everything with such great wisdom that it designed you, it designed me, it designed everyone in a single act. And we are the effects of that creative act of that will of God, which already from what we have been saying seems to be a will much more powerful than ours. Let's see. If any of you make an act of your human will and believe something will be created, I am no longer saying the entire universe, and staying created, who knows how many centuries and all things with their own effects. The sun created as sun and giving out light and heat, the earth created as earth, and the roses as roses, and the water created as water in a way that quenches the thirst, that wets, that has all its beneficial effects, and then keep it that way for many centuries. See how far we are from doing this. An infinite distance when one makes those very small considerations of everyday things we have before us. What an immense difference exists between the will of God and the will of the creature. Mr. Acuna listens to a comment from the audience and comments that this is why there is perfect balance because it comes from a will that acts with infinite wisdom. For that reason, well, it is possible in any of to you, for that reason, well, it is impossible in any to you if it seems that it would be an imbalance not to think this way. I don't think you have infinite wisdom, am I right? Yes. And even from a human understanding, it would be an imbalance if there were lungs and no air. Now, from the point of view of divine wisdom, it would be a herent thought to have such an imbalance. If for us tiny creature it seems an imbalance, well, imagine for God, a God of infinite wisdom, it would be unthinkable. That is why, just by us taking these considerations now, one can really see who God is and who am I. We have, I think, when making these kind of reflections, become too conceited, like there was little difference between God and myself. And because we see ourselves too much and see little of God, that is why we believe we are something. But by seeing things as we are seeing them now, who God is and who I am wouldn't it be worth it now to try to do the will of God or maybe it's more interesting to do mine when I have that will of God before me and I say no well, let's us put them on a weighing scale. On one side, 
the will of God that we already examined a little bit and on the other side my will let's see which one weighs more which one has more worth unfortunately mine is usually the one chosen incredible if we really think about it incredible how we are not interested in getting to know the interior will of God because it wants to become alive in us although we have asked for it for 2,000 years your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and we still continue to ask before that infinite will of God and having seen the differences forming in our minds and understanding of the immensity of the will of God and still not being able to reach infinity because it's impossible for us. We may reach how grand it is until our imagination finds that it can no longer go further. And at that point, we already find an immense difference between His will and ours. But to reach infinity, on the other hand, now having this infinite God that invites us, a God that invites us to join Him, to participate of Himself when He tells us the will of God as God operates it, the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. That should make us go crazy looking at it from every aspect possible because having this will of God before us <clears throat> when we meditate on it <clears throat> it seems that some veils are being lifted whereas before these veils are mostly closed because we were contemplating and living out of our own will even at the level of human sanctity. But now with these veils removed, exposing the differences between creator and creature, now faced with this notion, as I was telling you before, we should go crazy and do everything possible. Seeing now this infinite will of God that surrounds me in all things, that with a simple act of his will created me, preserves me, if it had not been for an act of the will of God in creation, I would not even be able to form a single thought by myself. It is unthinkable not to desire to be united to that life, to not believe that this will of God is my life and that I can extend myself in that immense will of God to, to take some of the goods that are in it when it acts so that act of the will of God becomes my act. Our Lord takes Louisa throughout all her writings, well, before that, throughout her entire spiritual life, gradually teaching her how to live in the divine will and teaching her how to live in the divine will consists in teaching her how the will of God operates and how it wants her to participate in that operating. I am going to share a thought that I just realized. In Louisa, it is not m messages that Jesus or God gives as, for example, during apparitions. The Blessed Virgin gives a message and someone listens to it and writes it down and everyone reads it. In Louisa, it is not done this way. In Louisa, God, Jesus showed her in her interior all the marvels of his will. He made her see them 
He gave her the knowledge and the understanding when being out of herself, making rounds in all the acts the will of God had done, she saw them. And once the life of that act done in the will of God was formed in Louisa, then coming back to herself, she wrote what she already had as property and as riches. I don't know if you can see the difference. This is why I tell you these are not messages. This is the written testimony of the work God did in Louisa. Let us put it in another way. To give an example, first God would put or infuse, let's say, purity in Luisa, and then Luisa spoke to us about purity. But not in the way we imagine it. Someone in the audience asked Mr. Acuna if it was given in the form of a revelation. Mr. Acuna responds, what was the revelation? The words? No, the work that God was doing in Louisa. God was forming a work in her. If you can call that revelation, I personally see I personally see it as much more. It is a work done by God. It is the same as in the Blessed Mother. It is a work done by God. If the Blessed Mother would have written, I go, I went, the Divine Maternity, etc., it would not be messages, but rather the news of the work that God had done in her. What revelation could we find here? We could see it as a revelation if we see it from the standpoint of God telling us what he already did in her, beginning by first telling us how he worked in the Blessed Virgin and then her telling us. In other circumstances with other many known seers, and I am only making reference to those approved by the Church, for example with Blessed Juan Diego, the Blessed Mother appears to him in Guadalupe and gives him a message. I want a temple built here. I want to manifest the tenderness of my maternity. I am the mother of God. And Juan Diego repeats what the Blessed Mother tells him. This is a message. To St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, Behold the heart, etc. And then she tells us what Jesus told her. A message is delivered. The same with the messages given at Fatima and La Salette, etc. The Virgin, the Blessed Virgin appears but does not first do a work in the seer. And much less a divine work. And then the seers give news of what the Blessed Mother did within them. It is not like that. Of course, I do not want to say by this that the Blessed Virgin, when she appears to someone, it does not do good to the one receiving. Of course she does. But here the important thing is that in Louisa, God does not use her in the same manner. Louisa is not an instrument like a telephone that serves as means to deliver a message. Louisa is not a mere secretary taking notes. Louisa is a work of God. And Louisa's writings give us a testimony of what God did in her. That is why many times people say that Louisa's writings are so attractive or that they are so full of life because they coincide or they overflow from the life lived by Louisa. Not of a news without the substance of a life lived, 
but rather simply a message? Por eso, la y nuestro Señor se lo dice, la manera en que la obra hecha en ti... That is why our Lord tells Luisa, the work done in you will be communicated to others when they who desire to read your writings discover what I did in you and will dispose themselves so that what I did in you will be also done in them. Well, this was a parenthesis because we were trying to examine how being ourselves poor, very limited creatures, when we reflect on ourselves, we discover our own limits in reference to what we are. And when we see ourselves without God, it seems to us that we are something grand. But when we begin to see this will of God, we grow smaller. It seems that from the grand notion we had of ourselves, we start to see ourselves becoming smaller. We start to evaporate when we put our attention on God, turning away from our own will and all the low life that our will produces, a life in which we are as if locked up in this little world of our own. This little world of our own. And when we open ourselves from this little world and begin, when we begin to discover the grand world in God, my little world, where I am the king, and the rest, little less than my slaves, begins to dissolve. So, it is extremely important for us to meditate on this divine will as we are going to do, or so we are going to be doing during these two days to come, today, tomorrow, and a little bit on Sunday. And we hope we hope to immerse ourselves in this divine will, but more than immerse ourselves, because by immersing those that have had the experience understand it as something like getting into a sea and seeing very little. Those who have experienced diving in the sea know you can open your eyes and may not see beyond four or five meters. In this sense, it is not a question of submerging ourselves, but of throwing ourselves into this sea, like an immense atmosphere of which we will not be able to see where it ends. But we can admire not only five meters, but who knows how far, as we could more or less see when we examine very briefly this act of creation spreading out before us, it is as if this infinite and great will of God unfolds before our eyes and we begin to try to savor, to enjoy ourselves in admiring even from our limited state of being creatures the creative act of God from which all created things took new life out of its nothingness became created and remained preserved and among those millions of created things you also stand as a created thing also depending on that creative act of God's will who has not tired of keeping you in act and keeping the air, water, and all created things, the sun, etc., conserved so that you, created thing, can also carry out differently your office within creation and complement the creative 
and conservative act of that infinite will of God who once you created with all this creation within all this creation and that wants to give you all the goods that his will contains so that in you earth the will of God can be done on earth as it is in heaven Mr. Acuna comments that he has lost track of time and maybe it is time to take a break we will take a break staying in this creative act of the will of God trying to find our place more and more during the following talks to come So let's reflect a little on this too, and then we continue.